Wow, <laughs> that was hard. <laughs> okay, so sorry about that. I really, really tried to get on and I couldn't. So we're going to um, go get going right away. Um, I'll read these standard announcements quickly. You guys can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Mental Health Board, who we are. The Sonoma County Mental Health Board is an advisory board empowered to listen to the concerns of our constituents and to help formulate policies that offer a consistent continuum of care for all those with mental health challenges. We are further empowered to advise the County Board of Supervisors on the mental health system of care. The Mental Health Board mission. <clears throat> the Mental Health Board acts as a community focal point for mental health issues and advocates for the development of a community network to promote the following. Coalition building that will create a unified voice to impact public policy and awareness, a wider understanding and knowledge of mental health issues, the integrity of mental health services, and the involvement of clients and families in mental health planning. The Son Mental Health Board vision. The Sonoma County Mental Health Board collaborates with the Mental Health Services Division of the Sonoma County Department of Health Services to increase public and professional awareness of persons with mental health challenges and to eliminate the stigma attached to those mental illnesses. We strive to positively impact the mental health system by listening to public input and working with mental health services to create policy that will offer hope to families and individuals living with mental illness. So I'm supposed to do a quick roll call. Fran Adams. Bob Cobb. Present. Peterson. Myself, I'm here. Marianne Swanson was excused. Sherry Wires. Patricia Gray. Peter McAweeney. Uh -huh. you. Um, Robert Hales was going to be late, Carol West, Becky Ennis, Betsy Chavez, Michael Johnson, Here. I see you, Sh um, Betsy, Shannon Barton-Wren, and Annabelle Nygaard. Here, hi. Okay, hi. And is our Peers Coalition person here? No, okay. So. We do not have a quorum. I look fuzzy. Oh well. <laughs> we don't have a quorum, so um, we will um, do the approval of the minutes later. And Kate Roberge um, has offered to give her time to the presentation, so we'll um, we will not have the consumer affairs report. Are there um, public comments? Um, or concerns? Um, okay, Kathy, I see Becky Ennis is listed as a participant, I believe. Right oh, now. okay. Tori, maybe you can get her over here. And it's an all marker here. Hi, Kathy. Sorry, I'm on the wrong side. Here I am. Oh, that's okay. It took me forever to figure out how to get in today. Um, <laughs> okay, so were there any public comments? Not hearing any. 
Um, is Honor Jackson there, Tori? Yes, he is. Would you like me to move him over? Yes, please. So, hello, Honor. Um, the Mental Health Board has decided to um, appreciate some part of our mental health system each month. Okay. And this month, we have decided that um, partly in honor of Black History Month, but also just because um, we like the program, um, that we are going to present our certificate of appreciation to the Community Baptist Church Collaborative this month. And in honor of your ongoing going commitment to the African American youth in our, in our county and your consistent support of their mental and emotional health. So Honor Jackson um, is going to accept the certificate and tell us just a, a brief little bit about your program. So Honor, if you could take over. He might need to unmute himself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Sorry, I was muted. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, this uh, certificate of appreciation. Um, and I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about our, our programs. Um, there are four programs under the Community Baptist Collaborative. First, there's Safe Harbor Project, which provides music as stress relief. We provide calming, relaxing sounds, music with outreach to churches, civic groups, jails, healthcare providers, and individuals throughout Sonoma County of all ages. <clears throat> Saturday Academy and Village Project work together as two organizations, two programs. Um, they provide faith-based targeted education programs to enhance life skills, self-esteem, personal growth, coping skills, and knowledge of community resources. Our target age groups are five to 12 years old for the Village Project and 13 to 18 for the Saturday Academy. The next program is the fourth program is the Bridge to the Future Rites of Passage. <clears throat> it is an eight month program uh, for youth eight, ages eight, 14 to 18, excuse me. This program uses adult mentors, including civic and community leaders and elected officials, uh, volunteers, curriculum specialists to provide youth with life skills such as self-esteem, team building, wellness, nutrition, etiquette, <clears throat> cultural awareness, time management, financial awareness, career planning, public speaking, college prep, and ca uh, campus visits, and community service. These skills will assist and guide our youth into successful transition to adulthood in a culturally diverse community. Activities and workshops consist of monthly three hour, that's for Rites of Passage, monthly three hour sessions and field trips to practice acquired skills. <clears throat> and then I'll uh, dive a little deeper into kind of what we do. Um, Rites of Passage along with a dedicated group of community volunteers proudly celebrates 21 years of touching the lives of more than 320 students. 314 graduates as of today. Many of the graduates uh, rights of Rites of Passage are successfully giving back to the community across the nation. They are first responders, lawyers, entrepreneurs, teachers, coaches, ITs, business leaders, and more. The board, the, uh, rep the Rites of Passage board recently expanded to build additional capacity for growth and sustainability. Uh, Rice of Passage enjoys partnership with Federated Indians <clears throat> of Great and Rancheria, Redwood Credit Union, 
and the Hansen Foundation, as well as a number of local businesses. The Village Project and Saturday Academy are developing the Starfish Project. The Starfish Project will address the associated risk factors of stigma, inadequate information regarding the mental health issues, the lack of trust for mainstream services, and the lack of acceptable mental health services for the Afri African American community in Sonoma County. The Safe Harbor Project is proud and excited to announce the launch of K-SHIP. Uh, it's an internet radio, <clears throat> radio station. The station will provide free music designed to relax, calm, kick back and groove. There will be, a, there will be jazz, R&B, ambient and meditation uh, music, neo soul and gospel music. The station will also offer a platform promoting mental health services and events as well as interviews, live remote simulcast and presentations from mental health specialists to better educate the African-American community on seen and unseen mental health issues. You're invited to come sail with us on K-SHIP. Uh, with COVID, the Community Baptist Collaborative Collaborative has successfully pivoted and adjusted to conducting our programs via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube to engage our students, adults, parents, and volunteers. And finally, above all, we would like to thank Mental Health Services, Behavioral Health Services, and Sonoma County Mental Health Board for supporting us, thereby making a healthier community. And we thank you, appreciate it. God bless. Thank you so much, Honor, and your programs are even more um, diverse and robust than, than I knew about. So thank you for explaining what you do. Okay, I see yeah. that um, we, we are going to move the um, bills report up um, so that the presentation can have um, enough time and Maria. So, um, Bill? Sure. <clears throat> Don't have a lot of new information to offer. Um, we are um, in the process of preparing our first budget to share with the Board of Supervisors. So this is the same step we've taken each of the two years um, I've been here previously, whereby we put together information um, for the board regarding um, what our budget would be if we were um, uh, left to only the behavioral health funds that are available through the state. And um, with that, if there is not adequate funds to support the programs we have, we need to make a proposal to them regarding what our budget would look like absent um, additional county funds. So a reminder that each of the last each of the last of the two years, the county has backfilled our programs with county funds so that we've not had to make um, significant cuts over the last couple of years. We have also discussed with the county the problems associated with this process. So specifically, the because this is a transparent process, um, once the information is shared with the board, the information is soon after shared with the public. and um, as you know, when folks see proposed cuts, um, it is upsetting. And um, this has particularly been the case in the area of, of peer services. So we've talked about this dynamic. And while, um, you know, we and everyone, you know, we speak with is supportive of the transparent process, this part of the process, um, we don't recommend we, we go forward with it. So we are talking with the board about alternatives for that, and I'll share those with you if, if they develop. Um, one of the budget areas um, is Measure O. So um, if you remember your Measure O presentations we've offered in the past, um, that sales tax, which was approved in November, covers part of the hole we have in our budget, right? So. Measure O will bring in roughly 25 million a year in a full uh, budget year. And roughly half of those funds were um, 
set aside for existing programs. So to address existing um, needs for sustained funding and new programs because uh, no one wanted to do a, a new sales tax and not see the, uh, the system grow. So because of that, Measure O does not fill, it's very helpful. It's a, it will bring a lot of relief to the budget process, but it doesn't meet all of our needs. And so um, we continue, you know, forward to figure out how Measure O funds will, will be utilized in our budget. And that process um, has been um, inserted into that process is a new Board of Supervisors ad hoc committee. Um, so a set of supervisors are uh, meeting with us to um, talk about Measure O and give us direction on how it's been implemented. We had our first meeting with them, and that meeting largely uh, covered the past budget issues so that they understood have better information about the relationship between the new funding and the um, um, the budget cuts and proposed cuts that have been proposed in the past. So we had that first meeting with them and then moving forward with them, we'll talk specifically about um, the area, the categories in the expenditure plan, uh, offer them information about how we can move forward and then take direction from them about how to move forward. So those have been the, the primary work right now is in the, that area of budget. Um, additionally, we um, uh, opened our interviews today for behavioral health section managers. So um, a little over two years ago when the first budget problem hit, there were a number of significant cuts that were made. And um, one area of cuts was in administration where positions were consolidated. So. Um, Sid McCauley um, inherited acute services, for, which is crisis, so crisis services, forensic services, and adult services. So that's a, an area of responsibility uh, usually covered by two section managers. And we did not replace the youth and family services manager. So I have served in that role, and I work uh, closely with Karen Saliti, who is the client care manager for youth and family services. So together, she and I have been um, providing administrative support to youth and family services. Uh, that's, that administrative structure is not sustainable. We are not able to take care of all the administrative uh, work we need to do, which is supporting the programs, monitoring the programs, uh, supporting system improvements. Um, and so the uh, agreement was in this year we would open an adult section manager, an adult services section manager position so that the, those programs will be separated out, crisis and forensic on one side and adult services on the other. And then we will add a youth and family services section manager. So we opened recruitment um, a little over two weeks ago and had our first set of interviews today. By the time we meet next, I would hope to be introducing you to some new section managers, which will be a very welcome part of the rebuilding for the Behavioral Health Division. So those are the priority areas. I'm happy to take questions about any area I did not cover that you have interest in. A question in the chat, and yeah. I, I had a question about it too. Sure. Um, the question is, did you say that you will no longer include peer community in preliminary budget review process? No, I did not. I did not say that. I said that we, as part of this year's budget process, one of the dynamics we've discussed with the CAO's office and the board is how troublesome this, that part of the process has been, that that is not... Um, it's something that's uh, not as constructive as the process should be. And so we are looking for um, solutions um, to the budget process that would allow us to take a different approach than, again, proposing a series of programs to be cut that includes the peer programs. Okay, so that's, um, I think you answered that question. And my question too. Um, so you are going. If the transparency is going to continue, right? Yeah, that, that's that's not going to um, 
that's not going to uh, change. What what we're what I've ex what we've all come to realize is the step in the process whereby we have to present a balanced budget to the board without county funds requires us to indicate where we will make cuts, and that is a complicated process because. Um, it's very difficult to make cuts in our system because our system is fairly lean. And, you know, there's always going to be a difference between cuts you propose and cuts you want to make once you get down to the final decision. It's a process by which you're refining the decision all the time because you're looking for ways out and such. And so, um, you know, we're just pointing out that an early presentation that involves us saying, absent additional support from the county, we're going to have to cut the peer services and some adult contracts. Um, it just creates a, um, a, you know, it's a problematic communication. It creates a rift in our relationships. Um, we've gone through, if you think about it, the last two years uh, as a community we have gone through and as a particular community, the peer community has gone through all of the trauma that goes along with uh, thinking for a series of weeks, your programs might be cut and the programs weren't cut. And so continuing to go through that year after year, I think we all recognize is problematic. And so we're looking for a different way to have a transparent process and not rec recreate that um, trauma year after year. Okay, and um, Kurt Johnson, said with the new national administration in Congress, should we anticipate changes in federal funding or programs? So we've got no direct information about that. We hope so. Uh, one of the areas to look at is the, the COVID relief package, uh, uh, right? And so watch whether or not local, state and local funds are in that. If they are, that will be helpful in the short term. In the long term, um, we hope that it, this administration is more supportive of um, health care and expanding health care, which would be a benefit to um, the behavioral health area. Okay, and then there's one more that um, it's a clarification. Oops, I was reading it and it. The MHSA question? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we've talked about in the past that one of the things we want to do is get peer services out of year-to-year -year county funding and into a sustained funding source, such as the Mental Health Services Act. Uh, and unfortunately, we've done that, and that is a better situation than not doing it, but it doesn't solve the problem because at the end of the day, if and again, I'm going to reinforce what the step in the process is. The step in the process is the board says to us, send us a balanced budget without any extra money, which is to say, send us a balanced budget with only the money Sonoma County gets from the state and the federal governments um, to operate. And as soon as we do that, we have to start going through our programs and looking at what our mandates are, what we have to do. And then we have to look at things we can't afford not to do. Um, and that always that will always result in us talking about cutting some programs that are too valuable to cut. So um, the MHSA strategy was helpful but didn't solve the problem because at the end of the day, when we have to propose a balanced budget, we have to go in and look for um, funds for mandated and necessary services. Okay. So um, if there's no other questions, we have one other short presentation. Um, Maria, did you have something that you wanted to say about the peers program? Yeah, well, I just wanted to say hello and, you know, reintroduce myself because I see a few names that I don't know. Um, my name is Maria Regin, pronouns she, hers, her, and ella, and I am part of the Peers Coalition at the JC. Um, I just wanted to share what we've been up to at the JC and most, but more importantly, what we're planning this month as it is Black History Month. Um, we are actually planning on collaborating with our Black Student Union 
um, in hosting a workshop where we will have a panel discussion on stigma and obstacles in the Black community. So we're, help, we're hoping to have two BSU members and our new um, SRJC Black therapists that were just hired. Um, so that would be Nadine Henley and Dr. Corey Timberlake that we're really excited to have on board. Um, this is out for the community as well. So if y'all are interested, I would love to have y'all there. Um, mainly targeting, of course, our community college, but we like community members as well. Um, but that's really it. I wanted to keep it short and simple because I know we do have a presentation, uh, but I am very talkative. And if y'all want to get to know me a little bit more, or have any questions about what I do in my work, um, I would love to answer them. Do you have a date for that presentation? Yes, I do. Um, it's February 25th from four to six. And I have a flyer. Um, we're still working on developing the Zoom ID, but it's going to be more of a Q&A prices and getting to know our BSU on campus. Okay, so um, maybe you could yeah. send information to Tori so that we can Yeah, I'm going to actually send that over to her right now. Okay, thank you very much. Can, can you include your email address in the chat so that folks can reach out to you directly? If yeah, they of have course. Questions? I'll do that right now Thanks. too. Okay, thank you very much, Maria. Um, and we do have a presentation today. And I think that um, we've finished the business that, um, the board business that I think is necessary. So I am going to um, pass it over to Wendy and I'll let you explain your topic. And thank you so much for taking can to step away from your other jobs. No problem. Um, I'm just worried that we're missing one of our panelists. Um, Tori, uh, Sean Kelson is on the panel. He might be signed in under the name Interlink. Sean, can you respond in the chat if that's you so that they can move you? Okay. Would you move him on to the panel? <laughs> Thank you, Tori. Yep, oh, there we go. Beautiful. Okay. Bill, I'm stealing your old office so I can take my mask off. <laughs> if that's okay. Where am um, I? I know. Well, yeah. Okay, so uh, Kathy, thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you tonight and, and the panel for joining me um, and pulling together uh, what I hope is going to be a wonderful presentation. Um, I do have a PowerPoint, so I'm going to share that so I can talk about what we're going to be discussing tonight. Get that started here. Okay, I'm hoping that that is showing up on your screen. Okay, I see heads nodding, so we're gonna go with yes. All right, <clears throat> we were invited to give a presentation about trauma-informed care and what are some of the elements involved in trying to shift a behavioral health system culture and structure toward a trauma-informed approach. And so I'm going to be sharing with you um, a few statistics about trauma and PTSD um, in the U.S. and some information from the ACES study about this topic, just to kind of lay the groundwork for it. And then we're going to move into what it means to shift to a trauma-informed approach. And the panel is going to be um, assisting in and answering particular questions about that and sharing some of their stories um, to help really color this in for us. So that's the plan for tonight. And that sounds good to everybody. I will proceed. Okay, I see heads nodding. We're going to go for it. Uh, uh, just before anyone asks it, um, I will send the slides to, I think Betsy was the one who was working with us. So Betsy, I'll send them to you so that you can share them outward um, afterwards in case people don't feel like taking notes. And also my cat writes all my PowerPoints. So you might notice in the selection of pictures to illustrate that he features prominently. Okay, <clears throat> that being said, Let's talk about trauma by the numbers. Here's what we know. 
um, from some of our national statistics from the various trauma institutes and national organizations that study this. 70% of adults experience at least one traumatic event in their lifetime. And it's estimated that 98% of people served by behavioral health have experienced trauma. 20% of people who experience a tra traumatic event will develop PTSD. So that means about 8 million people have PTSD in a given year in this country. And one in 13 people will develop PTSD at some point in their life. So this is not a small problem. This is a this is a large, large issue that affects many, many people. <clears throat> you are most likely familiar with the ACE study, what's known as Adverse Childhood Experience Study, but I'm just gonna go over really quickly for those who might be new to it. So the Center for Disease Control teamed up with Kaiser Permanente um, to collaborate on this study. It was over a 10 year longitudinal study involving 17,000 participants. And they looked at the effects of adverse childhood experiences or trauma over the lifespan. And it's the largest study that's ever been done on this subject. And here are just some of the things they found that are relevant to tonight's talk. One in six men have experienced emotional trauma. 80% of people in psychiatric hospitals have experienced physical or sexual abuse. 66% of people in substance abuse treatment report childhood abuse or neglect. 90% of women with alcoholism were sexually abused or suffered severe violence from parents. If those numbers shock you and alarm you, that's good. It means that you uh, have a compassionate heart. We should be alarmed by this. We should be worried about this. The ACE study further found that two thirds of all suicide attempts are attributable to childhood adverse experiences. 64% of adult suicide attempts are attributable to childhood adverse experiences and 80% of child adolescent suicide attempts are attributable to childhood adverse experiences. <clears throat> so I know that suicide prevention intervention is um, a very important topic and commitment of the board. Um, with that in mind, understanding how trauma impacts us and how to shift a system to our trauma-informed care is one of the ways that we could speak to that. So um, this statistic is now 10 years old. I was trying to find the updated version, but it's still the one they have on their website. They, in 2010, they estimated the annual cost of child abuse and neglect in the United States was $124 billion when they took into account the legal and hospital and other costs associated. It can only be higher now. <clears throat> Therefore, we need to presume the clients we serve have a history of traumatic stress and, and exercise universal precautions by creating systems of care that are trauma informed. We should assume we're dealing with trauma until we know what it was and handle with care. So with that in mind, I would like to talk about how we would shift our approach. I'm very fond of this quote from Einstein. He says, the world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. And so I want us to consider that as we look at how might we want to shift an approach to adapt to the idea that trauma is here with us, it is widespread, and if we're going to exercise universal precautions, that might mean some fundamental shifts in how we operate. <clears throat> Why does that matter? Well, one, it matters because we might unintentionally cause harm by the practices that we engage in, by our policies, and activities that are insensitive to the needs of our clients. And re-traumatizing somebody unintentionally is a real possibility, and we would like to avoid that. But the other reason it's important is that understanding trauma also means recognizing that our own personal traumatic experiences as the helpers or the stress associated with working in human services or health services can impact the helper's emotional and physical well-being as well as their work success and satisfaction. So if we want a system of care that is itself healthy, then it needs to take into account both, um, both the helpers and the helped and, and create something around both of them that honors the experiences they're each having. So at this time, I would like to introduce our panel. I didn't have time to get pictures in advance, so I used the ones that I had on file. Um, Sean Bolin, would you mind telling people who you are? Um, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm Sean Bolin. I'm the program manager over at uh, the Wellness and Advocacy Center. 
Um, I've been a career provider um, for about eight years now in a variety of roles. Um, also have a master's degree in counseling, which I do not use. Thank you. Sean Kelson, would you introduce yourself? Yes, <clears throat> I'm Sean Kelson. I'm the program manager, uh, West County Community Services program manager who oversees Interlink Self-Help Center, as well as the um, Petaluma Peer Recovery Center. And I've been professionally doing peer services in this arena. I've done it in other arenas as well for about 13 years. Thank you. Erica, Chloe, would you introduce yourself? Hi everyone, Erica Chloe with um, Providence or St. Joseph Health. I'm community behavioral health lead and um, I've worked in multiple areas in our system of care. Um, and I've worn a lot of different hats. Um, for many years, I helped families navigate our system of care, which is the work that most of you are familiar with. I also worked um, in disaster response on the California Hope team as a medical social worker. And currently in my role, I'm really a system analyst that looks at how do people get access to care and how, how do we do that in a healthy way in our system of care. Thank you. Susan Standen, would you introduce yourself? Hi there. Um, I, let's see, I have been a recipient and provider of um, peer support services since 2011. So I guess that makes uh, 10 years now. And I'm not affiliated at the moment with any agency or organization. So I inhabit my role as peer at large. Uh, and I'm also currently a, um, a graduate student um, in the field of transformative leadership. Thank you. And Betsy, would you introduce yourself? Yes, of course. So Betsy Chavez, I work with Hannah Institute and I'm the education specialist and I'm also um, a member of this board of the mental health board and my background is counseling as well. I got a master's and am currently yeah, using it, I would say. Thank you, panel. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna consider uh, four questions about shifting a system toward trauma-informed approaches and culture. And we're gonna have various members of the panel respond with what helps and what hurts in these four areas. Um, and then I also have some summary slides about what some of the research has indicated in those areas as well. And then we'll wrap it up. So, um, so for each of my questions, the lead in is when shifting a system toward a trauma from approach, what is the importance of, and then we go into our topic. So our first one is the importance of relationships. What's the importance of relationships when shifting a culture? What hurts and what helps? Um, and we have uh, three panel members who are going to be responding to this question, uh, Sean, Sean, and Susan. And we have about 15 minutes on this question. So if you would each take five, will that work for you? I'm seeing a head nod. Okay, uh, Sean Bowen, would you like to go first? I'll try. Um, you know, when I think about shifting a system, um, First, I mean, there, there's kind of the individual level, uh, direct service providers working with people. There's also the administrative level, um, what's happening between the, the, the direct service providers, the administrative staff, the supervisors, um, and then kind of the larger system as a whole. So I'm going to try to really quickly hit each of those. I probably won't hit all of them. Um, when I think about relationships, uh, kind of when, when I've been in therapy um, or, or been receiving services, um, I feel like I, I got re-traumatized a couple of times. <laughs> um, a lot of it really had to do with kind of the power dynamics and just who was the expert, who, who had control. Um, and if, if I did not kind of follow the rules if I didn't agree to the treatment plan, if, if I didn't agree that someone else knew what was best for me, um, I, was, I was wrong. 
Um, I was the person who, who didn't want to get better. Um, I remember one social worker telling me that. Um, and and that, that disempowerment really hurt that relationship. Um, so I think what does help um, is really when, when choice, when choice is involved. I mean, when, when power is handed back because trauma is disempowering as a whole, um, we lose our sense of, of, of safety, of, of, of our will, of, 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 kind of our being. Um, so whenever choice can be handed back to the individual and collaboration can happen, that really does help. In terms of kind of the next level, uh, at, at the, the more administrative part, when I'm thinking about that, um, it, it, one of the most important things with, you know, supervising staff um, is really looking at their, their sense of safety in the work. Um, you know, I, I think that we, I know uh, that, that absorbing the stress, absorbing the trauma of others, being exposed to kind of just the constant pain of this world is very painful. Um, so how to give them also power in terms of what, what's the relationship with me? Um, how, how do I kind of really recognize my impact with them um, is, is core. Um, so as much as I can also kind of be trustworthy with them, consistent, um, that I'm also a person, I think that that really helps. Um, and then kind of in the, the larger and the system transformation, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy uh, with what Bill Carter said today in terms of, of looking at kind of the dynamics that have happened in terms of, of um, you know, the budget process as a whole. When the system is put into these kind of moments of stress and almost breaking each time, um, how do we relieve that? How, how do we not look at the worst case scenario, but maybe have something else where something else? I don't know. I'm really, I'm, I'm looking forward to having some stress reduced. So I think I'll keep it to that right now. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Susan, would you follow that up um, and share your thoughts? Have to find the unmute button. The maze of pictures and words on my screen. Um, you can hear me okay? Okay. Um, yeah, I was, let's see. Um, I had kind of mixed the uh, relationships and the system view in my, in my notes. So, um, I'm gonna uh, just sort of uh, wing it here. Um, is it okay if I address both of them? All right. Um, so I was thinking, um, first of all, just about why uh, we were mm, talking to the board about, about these things. And I was thinking of three things. One, as a board, you may be looking at different programs and organizations um, in your advisory capacity, you know, to the board of supervisors and looking at them to see whether they're trauma informed in actuality or that's just something on their brochures. Um, to as providers, loved ones or consumers of mental health services, you may wanna know whether any organization in which you participate is trauma informed. And then three, a third thought I, I had was that um, you may be wanting to make the culture of your own board more trauma informed. So I was kind of trying to address those three and I, I created a checklist that has five things on it. And it's, um, I call it Susan's list of what to watch out for. Um, and I'll name them first um, and I can put them in the chat if you'd like me to afterwards. Um, so these are things, I put them in the negative, I apologize for. Um, and uh, if I had more time, it would have been shorter. So um, I'm gonna try and keep this within my five minutes. Uh, deficit focus, watch out for that. Mixed messages or incongruence, watch out for that. 
places that hold policies as more important than people. Watch out for that. Three, lack of boundaries and confusion. And uh, maybe I actually have six. Um, <laughs> dominance and power plays, which Sean spoke to. Um, and lastly, reward-based protocols. So um, just to define each of these, what I mean, a deficit focus. The idea of providing kind of extra care to avoid re-traumatizing someone may seem like it's, it's focusing on someone's um, weakness rather than their strengths. But as I see it, a trauma-informed approach is actually not about treating someone as if they're incapable, like a car in need of repair. People who've survived trauma are incredibly strong and they face a lot of obstacles. I think of a trauma-informed approach more like refraining from adding to the obstacles on someone's road so they can access their abilities. So the second one, mixed messages, um, incongruence. Um, I was thinking about leaders of organizations, uh, in particular leaders who do not act congruently with their stated values. That's a big red flag. Um, and um, we just, as, as practitioners, um, we need to be aware of the messages that we send. And as consumers, we need to be aware of the messages that we're getting. So a manager that advises their staff to participate in self-care while they're running themselves into the ground is one of those mixed messages. Trauma-informed approaches are holistic in that way. Um, policies over people. Um, a quick example is um, uh, I was hospitalized one time at a place where someone, a patient there had once had a problem with drinking too much water um, and it was, they were damaging their health because of this. So as a result, they put in a protocol that everyone had to ask for a cup um, for water. And um, they would sometimes keep us waiting for a long time. Um, and that was very degrading. Um, it's, uh, it really is to the detriment of human dignity. So flexibility is a sign of a trauma-informed organization. Um, lack of boundaries, um, uh, uncertainty itself can be re-traumatizing. Re just going to keep it short. Uh, dominance and power plays, uh, as Sean said, um, the because I said so is kind of the watch phrase of um, incompetence and insecurity. It, it Reliance on power roles disconnects people and undermines trust. And then the last one, the re reward-based protocols. Um, when an employee or a client is motivated or manipulated to do something that makes them uncomfortable by the promise of a reward that's at the whim of the giver, this is really disrespectful and demeaning from my own point of view as a consumer. Each hoop that you have to jump through is another um, bash to personal dignity and self-esteem. They're exhausting and frustrating. And while short-term benefits can be, uh, can result um, or can appear to result, the long-term um, impact of this is a real loss in the humanity um, and the relationship. That's it. Thank you, Susan. Sean Kelson, would you um, add to that? Yes, sure, I'll set my timer. <clears throat> yeah, so what is the importance of relationships? I'd say relationships are very important. This is all about relationships. Relationships with ourselves, relationships with the organization we work for, our coworkers, with the people we serve, relationships with our community, as well as a relationship with this physical space that we do our work in. Um, <clears throat> what helps is organizations and individuals equipped to provide an arena where safety, trustworthiness, choice, collaboration, and empowerment 
are valued and co-created. Um, <clears throat> what, what, and help, what helps that is, you know, functional commitments to learning and exploring and hopefully gaining understanding of the biases we come to the table with as individuals. And I think utilizing the platinum rule, which is to treat others how they want to be treated and to be open enough to be able to get a sense of what that is like for others. Like don't go in for a handshake without asking, is that can be experienced as, I have not been invited to be in charge of my body in this space. So the first thing I understand is that I don't have that invitation and can create discomfort and, and disconnect. You know, ask, be able, willing to hear no. Um, avoid and censor ass assumptions about most anything, sexuality, gender, race, religion, team, sports, identification. You know, if you think it's, uh, it's respectful to assume everyone, all others are heterosexual, you know, keep that to yourself. Find another way to um, connect rather than making statements or asking questions that may not welcome people to show up in ways other than how you expect or assume them to be. And um, <clears throat> I think what hurts, um, not taking stock of ourselves and consciously growing assumptions, assumptions about what others might experience as respectful, assumptions about staff's understanding and buy-in in regards to trauma-informed care and culture shifting, and having one-size-fits-all approach, approaches that can discount the reality of the, sub -cult, of the cultures and subcultures we are dealing with in our provider ranks and those we serve. And, um, you know, practicing the, you know, universal precautions, which to me doesn't mean trauma screening everybody. And then since we've done that, decide we're right. And, you know, instead is to um, assume everybody's had a significant, had trauma and do our best to have an environment where people are not re-traumatized or traumatized for the first, <clears throat> first time, which is how the desks, nobody feels trapped behind it in front of or behind the desk, et cetera. And I set my timer, but I, ooh, I still have a little time left. Good, I didn't go over, I couldn't get it back, but that's my um, answer to question number one, the relationship question. Thank you, Sean. And as I considered the question, um, a couple of things came to mind about um, how the relationship might look. So I just wanted to, show you that on the what hurts um, interactions that are humiliating, harsh, impersonal, disrespectful, critical, demanding, or judgmental. And I know that in looking at that, probably some of you are wondering how many H's there are in the word duh at, at that statement. But, um, but I do feel I have to say it out loud because something happens when you are put into a position of authority and it, um, and somehow we, we leak away from being of service to others and start thinking about being the boss. And it, it does something to our identity. And you'd be surprised um, who I, you might encounter engaging someone in this way. Um, and you might be surprised that it might come out of yourself that way at times. I've been surprised when stuff has come out. I'm like, wow, that, what, what happened there? On the what helps side, Interactions that express kindness, patience, reassurance, calm, acceptance, and listening. I can be soft on a person while being hard on a particular issue that we're trying to solve together. And there is a way to separate those two things so that I can have that mindful space of validation with them in, in where they are. Um, frequent use of words like please and thank you. Um, I remember uh, when I was working at another entity, uh, I had a new staff that I was training who she was becoming very upset and she said, the clients are coming in for their morning medications and they're not even saying good morning or, or thank you to me. And I said, okay, I need you to stop. This is their house. You're the guest. You need to say please and thank you. This is not, this is not manner school for the clients. It's manner school for you. So let's, let's just pause for a moment and, and think through what, what you're insisting that someone be capable of when they first wake up in the morning and are trying to be civilized to another human. I don't do well with that. I could never demand someone else 
do that while trying to get the medication they need to get through their day. And so um, and things like that, just, yeah, I know that seems small, but it's not, it's large. Um, treating a person as a person and according them the dignity and respect that they deserve. All right, <clears throat> going on to our next question and considering this shift, some of you have mentioned already, but there is an importance to the physical environment itself. And so, um, uh, Betsy, would you uh, mind starting this one off and talking about the importance of the physical space itself? Oh, absolutely. Um, okay, so with, this is the really, one of my favorites here um, among these questions because oftentimes I don't think we really think about our space and, um, and the importance of our physical space. And I, and I say this because I, uh, before coming into HANA Institute and learning more about trauma-informed practices, um, I knew that there was some level of importance when it came to um, the confidentiality and the space being respectful and, and, and coming into a, a space and feeling pride. Um, those things I was aware of, but in terms of trauma-informed design, that wasn't necessarily something I had been exposed to before. And so when we're talking about trauma-informed design, um, specifically around the work that we are doing with HANA, we are, um, we are looking and exploring on trauma-informed spaces for students specifically. So let, we're exploring um, uh, middle schools and how middle schools can be transformed in a way that is trauma-informed and how does this look like? And so considering what has already been said, which is the front and center um, is, is safety, right? Considering a space and wonder and wanting to understand the very simple thing as an exit, you know, having an exit, a space that is identified and clear and in case someone needs to, you know, leave the space. That is a very, you know, perhaps it's insignificant, but at the same time, in time of crisis and time of, of, um, of, you know, of an, of an emergency, you need that clear space, um, an exit, a clear exit space. Uh, the other, the other components um, that I find very interesting when we're talking about environment and um, our space is is it is it being respectful? Is it being respectful of your of who you are? Does it identify? Do you identify? Does it is it a, a space that you feel as you belong, as you are being accepted, as you are being um, cared for? That is um, something that we we could consider. And so things that are, that need to be considered when we're talking about trauma-informed design um, is realizing that that is an important component and recognizing where, what is in that space that you are creating or that you're working in or that you're bringing in um, clients or students. Is the space welcoming? Is the space safe? Is, a, is there representation on the walls of the, of your student body, for example, of those that work with you, is it respectful? Um, is it showing Im positive images versus versus images that will create will re-traumatize those that are in that space? Is it a space that fosters um, resiliency? That fosters of uh, psychological well-being? Is it? Uh, it's so. These are just things to consider. And then you want to respond. You want to respond by making those changes to create a space that is supportive, that is nurturing, that is um, that is safe. And so uh, things that hurt, I would say, is exclusion. Anything that is exclusionary, you want to avoid. Anything that fosters the, um, the power dynamics. So you know, if, if you're creating a space where power is what you want to relay, where power is, is governing the space, that is traumatizing. 
And so you want to re you want to remove that from your space. You want to create a space that is inclusive and again supportive of those that are within that space by um, ensuring that it is safe, accepting, and supportive. I think I'll end there. Thank you, Betsy. Um, Sean Kelson, would you follow that up and say a little more? Sure. Yeah, in a little. So I think um, the physical environment set tones for those that work there that can affect their well-being and their service position, service provision. If people come in, <clears throat> the physical environment can affect their their well-being and the services being provided to them. You know, the environment is a first impression of a space, and images, furniture, and ambience <clears throat> are important parts. You know, making sure, like I said, uh, furniture is set up so that no one is likely to feel trapped, you know, and have comfortable furniture, colors on the walls, you know, open up, openness of the space, which often can be very challenging. You have a small space, but can be supported through lighting, <clears throat> possibly mirrors, um, you know, and having culturally sensitive images, having exits clearly marked, and in visual range when possible, you know, and you know, for safety, we're supposed to have the escape routes listed, but that that can be really helpful. It's like you go into a place, I know I can get out, how I can get out of here, even if I can't see the door, because for a lot of people, that's really <clears throat> important. <clears throat> and what hurts, um, you know, bars on the windows, though, if there's bars, you know, paint them, make them look like flower, do something, not <clears throat> just welcome to my cell. I hate this place. I have to work. And you're here, you know, to, to have it as fun as possible, you know, desks and furniture, yes, set up so nobody feels trapped, culturally sensitive imagery, or culture, oh, what, what hurts, culturally insensitive imagery, paint, furniture looking real institutional, but that's all I had to say about it. Okay. And as I was thinking about it, and I'm looking at our little friend here on the left who's trying to fit himself into the space, and not very well. And, and, you know, that oftentimes that's the feeling that one has. And what I had learned working in residential settings is that the house itself was a member of the staff. And if the home environment was accorded with the same respect that we wanted to accord to the clients, it, it did a lot of the work for us. But the times that I've had to work in an environment that did not do that, then 50% of my energy was spent overcoming the limitations of the environment and only leaving half of me left to connect with the clients. So it's actually a very powerful piece of trauma-informed care. Is what, can we make the physical space itself assist us in the work, even in uh, more um, intense settings or crisis settings? That can be done. There are ways to adapt a physical space to actually assist in the work instead of being something you have to overcome in the work. And so some of that looks like this. Um, I'll go with what hurts first. Uh, congested areas that are noisy. If I'm feeling overwhelmed, if I'm feeling flooded by an emotional or traumatic experience, uh, the more jarringness on my sensory system, the worse it is for me. And so, you know, avoiding congested areas. There are some of us who do our grocery shopping after 11 o'clock at night at Safeway because it minimizes how close someone might stand behind me in line. Um, COVID social distancing has helped my PTSD immensely because now I have a reason to say back off, buddy, that is less rude than what I just said. Um, and so poor signage that's confusing hurts. Um, uncomfortable furniture, separate bathrooms. And that one might seem strange, but if there's, this is the staff bathroom and this is the client bathroom, that actually sends quite an interesting message. And so that, that's one that I hear a lot um, as, as a concern. And then Certain colors are cold and non-inviting, and I, as Sean spoke to that of institutional uh, uh, paint decor um, <clears throat> versus, you know, what helps. Is there a treatment in waiting rooms that are comfortable or calming that they offer privacy? Is the furniture clean and comfortable? Do I have a no wrong door philosophy on someone trying to get help? Um, Okay, so they came to me to ask for a thing that I can't give, but can I help them get to the person who can rather than saying, I'm not the one who's supposed to do that. You know, so can I, can I navigate the space in a way that will let me do that? Or is the space set up as an all wrong door approach? <laughs> um, integrated bathrooms um, and wall coverings and posters that are 
pleasant and convey hopeful, positive messages and are uh, culturally re responsive. All righty, just gonna give us a quick time check here. We are doing good. Um, <clears throat> all right, policies and procedures are fundamental to shifting a culture. They can either work for you or against you. So here we have the cat version of following a policy. And then we have the dog version of very clear, transparent rules here, very cleanly articulated. We know what to expect. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in speaking to this level of system shift, let's see, Erica, would you mind starting us off and talking about this one? Sure. And I'm gonna copy Sean and set a thing for myself so I don't over talk. Um, so I love policies and procedures uh, because they tell us um, why and how we're doing something. And so when I started thinking about this, um, I started thinking about what Sean Bolin was talking about and all the different layers of our system and how when somebody has a behavioral health challenge, um, they and the people that love them go through multiple systems, um, criminal justice, health center, hospitals, um, inpatient behavioral health, residential treatment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so policies and procedures really are a blueprint of how someone moves through our system of care. And so what really hurts is very similar to the other areas, um, a lack of curiosity about the other areas and how they intersect can really hurt and harm and create um, lack of access, um, re-traumatize people if they move from one place to another place within inside of our system of care and it doesn't work very well. Um, they may have been promised something and then that doesn't work and they actually get disappointed and re-traumatized by the actual system itself. Um, writing at others, Sean says that a lot, like just if, if we're creating policies and procedures um, and we don't look at the whole and our side is right, we actually can cause um, a lot of harm by not being aware of how other parts of the system work. So at crisis stabilization unit, that's gonna work very differently than let's say law enforcement or the hospital or in a therapy office. And so we have to look at those intersections. Um, I think what helps is human-centered, is being the person um, and their choice and education about how the system does or does not work and informing people of how that works and helping them to feel empowered to understand what the policies and procedures are so that they know, you know how they move through our system of care. And then also for providers to feel safe in that. Um, if people don't know the rule book, then everybody can feel pretty, you know, in a crisis situation, does, they don't know, people don't know how to respond. So it's really important that we, we have shared community practice and understanding across. Um, in QIC, we've done that a lot around different areas where we ask you know, individuals with lived experience, we ask families, we ask the provider, we ask multiple different areas to talk to us about you know, what helps, what doesn't help, um, how, how is this policy and procedure working on the ground floor? And is it unrealistic? Like sometimes we make policies and procedures that actually don't work on the ground floor when we actually try to put, put them in place. Um, what also helps is education. So if you're creating a policy and procedure, especially around trauma-informed care, and you're just using buzzwords like um, empowerment, um, vulnerability, um, you know, client-centered, and someone actually doesn't understand what that means, you can actually cause more harm because the providers might be overwhelmed by the new policy and not know how to do that, and they don't actually uh, do those very well. Um, I think that I think that that pretty much covers it. I'll stop there, and I didn't go over time, so yay! Pretty great, thank you. Uh, Sean Bolin, would you add to that, please? Sure. Um, so I think it's really important to look at our policies and procedures, uh, the actual impact that they're having on, on the communities that, that we're serving. Um, as well as, as the staff who have to follow them. Um, so looking at, I, I think, like a robust benefits package, very helpful. I mean, it, it definitely really helps while also having like ad, adequate kind of coverage cross-training um, so that the employee 
even if they have the time accrued, actually feels like they can take it because the quality of services will not drop in their absence. Um, I think having uh, you know a, a robust complaint resolution process. Um, I mean, nobody wants to have a complaint, um, but if if it's actually like a real learning experience, and and the person who who is is raising the concern um, can be heard, I mean, it can be actually be a really empowering process for for someone who who felt mistreated in a program or, or by a service uh, to, to be able to have their voice heard, to actually get a, a resolution um, that's fair. And, and I, I think that that's rare in the world, but I, I think that, that that is where, you know, the, the policies and procedures can be really, really impactful. Um, and also, uh, you know, when we're working with trauma, escalation happens. Um, and so having very clear policies and procedures around de-escalation, um, you know, uh, <laughs> one day, one day there'll be no hands-on stuff um, in this world, hopefully, um, but at least having super clear policies and procedures in place and a complaint resolution process in place, if that's gonna happen, um, and we hopefully we're moving away from that sort of stuff. Um, but any sort of de-escalation, verbal de-escalation, having that in place as a first response and teaching staff that your first response is going to be, be a, you know, verbally just talking with the person, giving that space, giving them that exit whenever possible, um, and a robust kind of uh, debriefing process. Um, critical incidents do happen, um, and really looking at kind of how, how to support staff when that happens, um, kind of regardless of, of what caused it, um, I think is essential to maintaining a healthy workforce. I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Betsy, would you round that one out for us? Yeah, of course. Okay, so things that haven't been said already, I, I feel be, that um, COVID has given us the opportunity to really slow down some of the work that we've been, that we are doing with community and, and it, I feel it's been positive and, and I'm gonna um, explain why. So in various conversations, we've been able to take a step back and to really hear the voices of, of those who need to be heard. And so if we, if there is an, an intentional approach to genuinely hear what is needed from those that need it, is the best thing that we could do for our community. Because if there's anything that I that has happened throughout the years, um, our folks, our, our youth do not feel valued, do not feel heard, do not feel that systems and policies are in place to benefit and to move, um, like, to strengthen who they are. And so oftentimes our youth and our, um, I don't, our most vulnerable, but I like to say our most resilient communities are often, often feel isolated and not recognized when it comes to policy because policy unfortunately has been created to oppress our communities, to oppress those who really need the the policies to be and systems to be in favor of of them and so um I, I really would like for us to understand where we fit in the socio-ecological framework and to understand that and to really understand what the needs is from the voices of those who need the services and to implement services and policies that help and benefit but not not because it was brought not because it was developed by us, but because it was developed with and for our 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 community members. I think that um, that is well and. Thank you, Betsy. Um, on this one. 
My experience is that policies and procedures develop to help stabilize an organization, um, to give it a way to have some kind of consistency of practice. But then they start to take on a life of their own where they become, uh, where we start to set the policy about the policies about the policies. Um, and so they can stop progress in a system as well. They can stop its responsiveness from happening if, if we start to bend the service around the policy rather than writing the policy to support the service. So I like to, you know, I work in quality improvement and my position in the organizational chart falls under program support, which means I exist to support the programs. They don't exist to support me. Um, but sometimes policies and procedures can take on that life. So in considering how to summarize that, <clears throat> um, if you have a rule that always seems to be broken, it might be time to take a second look at that rule because maybe there's something wrong with the actual rule. You know, that the policy is not serving the purpose it was intended for. And rather than throwing more rules at it, it's time to step back and consider, were we off in understanding the issue we were trying to solve? Because consistency of practice is only a good thing if we're not screwing up. If we're consistently wrong, then it's actually not, it's not actually a virtuous attribute. And so sometimes the fact that a particular policy keeps getting broken is a warning light on our dashboard to say, hey, you need to look at this. You missed something important about the work there. Um, <clears throat> does the policy focus on the organization's needs rather than on the client's needs? Because it, it should have been, uh, you know, policies should have their foundation around the need of the client and the work um, <clears throat> over that of the work. Um, <clears throat> have I shifted to documentation with minimal involvement from clients? That's a red flag. That's a warning sign that um, we've drifted too far off of, of trauma-informed, uh, where documentation becomes this chore that I just need to get done and I don't really need to check in with my client about it. Um, but if this is a, a treatment plan for them and I've never spoken to them about it, then I'm missing something fundamentally important in that process. <laughs> um, Susan's going, yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> our, is my policy and procedure starting to create many hoops for the client to go through before their needs are met? If that's happening, we need to consider streamlining that somehow. And are there language and cultural barriers built into our policies and procedures? Because that can happen. Um, what helps? Uh, sensible and fair rules that are clearly explained and that focus more on what you can do rather than on what you can't do. Because just because I know what wrong looks like does not mean I know what right looks like. You know, most, most days when I wake up in the morning, my goal is to make a different mistake than I made yesterday. I'm not going for perfection. I'm going, can I just not keep making the same one? Can I just try a new one or something? So believe me, there's a great uh, creativity of human spirit when it comes to how many different ways can I mess something up? So just because I've explained don't do that does not mean that it's gonna be evident what I should do instead. I'm just gonna find a new and creative way to do something else I should do. Um, <clears throat> how much transparency is there in my documentation and service planning? Um, that transparency is something that helps. Um, are the materials that I'm using as tools are, and communication, are they in the person's language who is receiving them? Um, and am I continually seeking feedback from my clients about their experience in the program? Is, as Sean pointed out, is there a formalized way to get that feedback? And even in the form of complaints, because it's a way to revisit the policies and go, you know, we thought that was a good idea and it was for a time and then the world shifted and it's time to revisit it. And we're getting feedback that's telling us to do so. So if we have that system in place, then the policies and procedures can actually become a means by which we make the system transformation we're trying to accomplish. All right, so our last area to look at is the importance of our attitudes and beliefs. As you can see from our friends here on the screen, there are very different attitudes being represented here. So um, in shifting a system toward a trauma-informed approach, <clears throat> what is the importance of our own attitudes and beliefs? What hurts, what helps? Um, and I think, uh, Susan, can I give this one to you to start off? Uh, sure. Um... I think um, once again, it, um, congruence is really important. Um, 
do you honestly believe that this person has just as much worth and um, uh, and right to, you know, be upset and right to heal um, as someone else. We, our attitudes shift sometimes by increments and sometimes in huge leaps. Um, hang on, I'm setting my timer for myself. Um, and depending on the circumstances. So checking in with myself, what are my judgments um, in this situation? Um, and being honest about that and trying as much as possible to set them aside as, oh, wow, this is something to really look at as opposed to using it to batter the other person. Um, it probably there's a, a few H's on the duh, but it's so important to be able to realize where we are, our attitudes aren't perfect. Well, speaking strictly for myself, um, and I get into um, blame and resentment and, and hurt, and um, I can detach from someone else um, when I have one of those kinds of judgments. So I have to recenter myself in in my my basic belief system. Um, which is essentially that everyone has a reason for what they say and do. They may not know it, I may not know it, but I need to trust that, um, that they have a valid reason. It may not be one that I understand, but it comes from their experience. And when I come from that centered place, I find myself learning rather than assuming. And I find myself connecting rather than detaching. Um, and to I'm gonna take a page from Sherry Mead who, who wrote uh, Intentional Peer Support, um, the, the attitude and the practice of whose need am I really trying to meet here is critical. Um, when you think of someone who is a survivor of trauma and maybe they're going through a really, really bad time and they, they're desperate for help, they're, they're wanting it, they're in your office, and, um, and the first thing that they need to do is divulge a multitude of really personal uh, information um, about the most hurtful things in their lives to a complete stranger. Whose need is actually being met here? I recognize that the clinicians need information and yet this information is not for the benefit of the client in that moment. Um, this information is for the uh, provider. And instead of we have to go through this, so spill your guts or, you know, you have to go through this, so spill your guts to me. It's, you know what, this could be hard. What's the best way that we can get this information that I need for my own self without making it too hard for you? What's the best way that's gonna work for you to give me this information? What sort of pace are you looking for? You know, what kind of signs do you like, you know, would you like to give me when it's getting too much and you'd like to shift the subject for a minute? Um, that kind of attitude of knowing whose, whose needs are being addressed in any particular moment and taking responsibility for our own, um, I think is uh, really critical. So I just wanted to speak to that. Thank you for that. Um, Erica, would you follow that up? Sure. Um, so for me, this went a lot of different directions. So I'm just gonna try to keep it pretty simple because I think attitudes and beliefs cross into every area um, and we could deep dive into this for hours. Um, 
So as far as what really hurts around attitudes and beliefs, double binds, lack of emotional intelligence. So if we have attitudes and beliefs around not understanding grief, not actually understanding trauma, um, not understanding how anger, um, sadness, emotions play into trauma, um, that can cause a lot of harm uh, across, you know, as individuals, families, providers, uh, administration, you know, that can cause harm to everyone. And what I call, what I think uh, hurts the most about attitudes and beliefs in this context of if we're trying to change our system is recovery dictatorship. So when we have people that are judgmental and blame and are arrogant and are superior and think that they know the right way for someone to recover, they actually take away the things that uh, really help a person to recover, um, curiosity, um, innovation, um, resiliency, um, heart-centered, you know, you know, guts, gumption, you know, all of the things that, you know, are the things that help someone to really, the attitudes or the belief in ourselves that we can and do recover. Um, there's, what really helps is, is, you know, believing and having the attitude that no, there's no one size fits all. I mean, I have not yet to meet a human being that likes to be told what to do. And somehow, you know, in systems of care, um, there's a lot of people telling other people what to do. And I don't know anyone that really likes that. And so I think it's really important that we, as a system of care, look at those attitudes and look at ourselves in the way and what that does for us. And that's where that emotional intelligence comes in. If we're trying to tell someone else how to do something, it usually has to do with ourselves. So, you know, for example, you know, we might be working with someone and it's really painful and it hurts to see them continuously not get the support they need or, you know, repeat patterns that might be difficult and, you know, you want something different from, from them. And, you know, if, you're, if your belief is that they need to do it your way, um, I, I don't think you're going to be very successful. And I don't think that that's going to be, you know, the trauma-informed system of care that we're, we're looking for. So attitudes and beliefs really are the foundation of looking at how we can be the change. What is the change of heart that we need to have in order to have a healthy system? Thank you, Erica. <clears throat> and as I was considering it, um, one of the things that I encounter a lot in working with trauma is what I'm gonna term competitive grieving, which is not the latest Olympic sport, but it, it could be. Um, and it's, you know, it's, you're all familiar with one uppers, but there's such a thing as a one downer where whatever you went through, theirs was worse, you know, that, that, and, um, and something happens in, in care systems where we sit in a person's worst day a lot is, is we start to become inured to what hurts. Um, and, and your normal starts to move gradually and you don't realize it has drifted off center until you hear somebody in a crisis setting describing a presentation that's coming and saying, well, it's just anxiety, i.e. it's not as bad as, it's not as impactful on them as, it doesn't matter as much as, I mean, that's what's implied in saying it's just, you know, anxiety doesn't count as a real mental, Ill, whatever, put, put whatever assumption you want to on that. And, and you realize the normal has moved too far <clears throat> to where um, I have now engaged in competitive grieving. I, as a provider, I have now moved into a period of saying, get a real problem before I'll work with you. And think about, I mean, Susan's smiling at me, but think about the message that sends to, um, to a person where that may be the worst thing that's ever happened to them that they are trying to come in for help with. And for someone else, it might not hit the top 10 because they've had a rowdier set of real life merit badges. But be that as it may, I don't know just looking at somebody where that is on their spectrum. There really isn't a way to compare the alley and scale it and say that this one is bigger than that one because I truly don't understand where they've been before this. I don't know if they've developed a same resiliency set as somebody else. And so when I start to hear things like, well, it's just that, what I'm hearing is I'm now othering and relegating that 
that group of people to yours isn't big enough for me to care. Um, and you're just, you're just attention seeking. That's another one I hear a lot. Um, as opposed to recognizing that one doesn't engage that behavior if there isn't pain behind it, something's going on there. And so when you're considering that, <clears throat> um, when I'm asking questions in that interview that Susan was talking about, that assessment interview, if my questions convey the idea that there is something wrong with you in the very way that I ask them, <clears throat> I'm setting the tone for that interview. Um, and, and it'll be subtle. Um, it'll be subtle. And how long have you been depressed? Was your mother depressed? No. Um, it, it's, it's a pretty standard question, but it's different than saying, how long have you struggled with depression? I'm asking for the exact same bit of information, but the question is fundamentally different because suddenly depression is now this thing out here that we're struggling with as opposed to you being depression. Um, things like that, the very way you ask the question, um, <clears throat> if I, am I regarding their difficulties um, <clears throat> only as symptoms of? So the things that they are struggling with in their life are the symptoms of, as opposed to the things they are struggling with in life. You know, a, a person struggles, that's what happens. And my symptoms might make that harder or easier depending on the day, but my real life challenges are my real life challenges. What helps is asking questions that are for the purpose of understanding what harmful events may contribute to the current problems, as opposed to just ripping it open in a voyeuristic way because I wanna see all your pain laid bare. Uh, retelling the trauma story is, is many times re-traumatizing. And so it's, it's something that is that rather being mandated would be invited for a purpose. People tend to come to me for therapy around trauma because of what's happening now, not because of what happened then. What happened then is influencing what ha is happening now. And the now is what they're more interested in at the moment. And so oftentimes you can work with that and dip, dip into the backstory as necessary to fill it in um, without having to just rip the person's wounds open and go there. Um, and recognizing that symptoms may be a person's way of coping with trauma or could be adaptations to trauma itself. And so these things might be connected rather than disparate conditions that are happening. There's an interconnection that can take place and allowing that to be possible is the beginning of an attitude that lets me <clears throat> approach it more holistic. So we are <clears throat> just about out of our time. Um, I wanted to <clears throat> end by wrapping up with some the you know, core principles of a trauma-informed care organization <clears throat> um, it includes, as uh, our panelists have discussed, a safe, calm, and secure environment with supportive care. It includes a system-wide understanding of trauma prevalence, impact, and trauma-informed care. So it's, it is hard to implement this kind of a system shift unless it's all the way top to bottom. The whole system needs to understand what trauma is. Uh, Trauma-informed care is culturally responsive. <clears throat> it involves consumer voice, choice, and advocacy. It's recovery and consumer-driven <clears throat> and offers some trauma-specific services. And most importantly, it's healing, it's hopeful, it's honest, and it relies on trust and relationships in order to be successful. But who benefits? Why, why would we go through all that? That seems like a lot of work. <clears throat> well, here's who benefits. One, safety increases for all. It's, um, it's quite surprising that the uh, number of safety incidents you can reduce if you learn how to see them coming and respond in a way that sets a tone of safety and helps the person co-regulate with you and physiologically and come down as opposed to stepping into it and escalating it up. Um, it improves the social environment of our treatment programs in a way that improves the relationships not only for the clients to the staff, the staff to each other, and the staff to the leadership. Um, it cares for the caregivers, which is key. Um, <clears throat> we are called into this field. Um, it's uh, not, most of us aren't in it for the glory or the money. It's a, it's a calling. It's a service calling that, that speaks to us and pulls us in for life. And we're so good at being helpers that when we leave work, we go home and we're still the helpers because we're the best at it. So we might as well just keep doing it for everybody. And we have a really hard time letting other people help us and taking that time to decide that we um, are as deserving of care and regard as the people we're trying to serve. And so it, it allows the system to look at itself and say, wait a minute, 
we need to care for the caregivers too. If, if they are our instrument, that instrument needs to be well-tuned. Um, and improves the quality of services overall for everyone. It reduces negative encounters and events, creates a community of hope, wellness and recovery. It increases sense of success and satisfaction at work for the staff. It promotes organizational wellness overall, and it improves the financial bottom line, incidentally, to move to a trauma-informed organization. So um, <clears throat> that is our presentation, and I wanted to leave just a little bit of time in case people had questions. So Kathy, I'm turning it back over to you. Thank you guys so much. I really, really appreciate the presentation. I think that everybody should see and hear it. Um, really, really well done. <clears throat> Thank you, all of you. Does anybody have questions that they would like to ask? See, we're so thorough. <laughs> Let's see. I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you. It was very informative. Thanks, Becky. I also just wanted to say that um, really, really putting in your perspective made the presentation feel a lot more real. And honestly, I learned a lot from y'all. So honestly, everybody needs this presentation in their lives because, you know, I think it's really going to influence where the funding needs to go. So. Again, y'all are amazing and thank you everybody for the work that you do. I just want to indicate uh, appreciation for the effort. Each of you um, brought your own lens and experience to bear and it was very descriptive, um, very informative. Thanks so much. Tori, do you see any um, questions from the other attendees? Don't see any hands up and there's nothing in the um, chat. Um, can I can I add something, Kathy? Yeah, Kathy. I, wanted, I wanted to personally thank all, uh, Wendy and all the panelists for you know bearing with me in terms of timing timing and um, just love, love meeting you all, love working alongside you, loved um, the experience. I, I hope that we get to the opportunity to continue working together. There's a lot of wealth and, and value to that you all bring to our communities. And so we're very, very happy. We're very lucky to have you all um, be part of our world. And to also add that our next, um, our next meeting or our next board meeting, we will be talking about anti-racism and how that ties into trauma, just because that is that goes hand in hand. And it's really important that we we take a moment to understand it so that we can do our individual work um, and acknowledge and recognize just the effects that it has on our community and, and on our world, of course. And so just wanted to also point that out. So thank you all. And related to what Becky or Betsy just um, said, the mental health board meeting next month um, will <clears throat> start at 4.30 because um, we have um, Dr. Daniela Dominguez is presenting and um, she her presentation will take pretty much the full two hours. So. Um, it's going to, I, I'm looking forward to the presentation and hearing what she has to say. So, does anybody else and, have questions? And Kathy, if I could just um, thank the board for inviting me and the panel um, and for your commitment to this topic and to um, trying to affect system change and, and being voices of advocacy for the most vulnerable in our community. I really appreciate this opportunity and uh, the work that we got to do with Betsy. I am so, this is silly, but I'm really happy that the um, presentation got postponed for a year because I think that there's, um, I think all of us have more 
experiences under our belt that help us you know understand and realize the importance of the topic <laughs> so i'm it's too bad that you know the reasons that it got postponed for that whole year but i i loved your presentation i loved the participation of everybody on your panel so very much appreciate it okay yes thank you so um we do have a couple minutes left i'm going to count and see if we have a quorum because i see several more people have come and i'm thinking that we may actually be able to approve the january minutes if we do so do we have um what we've got we need eight people do we have that tori we have eight yes we have eight okay so um board members if you have had a chance to read the minutes from january 19th i would entertain a motion to approve the minutes my motion to approve the minutes let's see okay do i have a second i'll second it's carol okay and um my understanding is that we have to have a um, roll call since it's um, Zoom. So I'm just going to um, go through. Let me see. How do I? Let me pull up the list of attendees. Okay. Myself, I. Um, Carol? Yes. Peter? Yes. Oh, the list is jumping around. Bob Cobb. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Pierre Peterson. Yes. Betsy. Aye. Oh, Bob Cobb, you showed up twice. This list is not working for me because you're jumping around. Um, who have I missed? Anybody? Yeah, me. Annabelle. <laughs> Hi here. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So the minutes are approved for January 19th. And we talked about, um, we talked about next week. Was there any other important business that I missed presenting? Kathy? Yes. Becky. Hi. Thank you. I'm just, I would you remind me, please, when we will return to the commitments made from the mental health board retreat? Um, yes, I, I believe that um, we have to figure out when we're going to have time to do that. At the executive committee meeting, I'm hoping that we can actually um, address coming up with our statement. So if everybody could look at the PowerPoint that um, I think was sent to everybody, right, Tori? Um, not the PowerPoint, the um, Jamboard. The minutes? Jamboard, yeah. The, the minutes in the Jamboard, yeah. So um, we'll look at it at the executive committee meeting I think that's um, the foreseeable in the foreseeable future in the next month or so. I think that's the best time to actually look at it and plan what we're going to do. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there is nothing else, I mean, that presentation was powerful. Thank you again, all of you. Um, if there's nothing else, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Would somebody like to make that motion? Nobody wants to leave. <laughs> I mean that. <laughs> well, I was told last time that I forgot to do that. So <laughs> we need a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I, I move we adjourn. I second I that. Second. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks again. 
and we'll see you all next month. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh -huh. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.